Today I'm going to be talking about wilderness safety and first aid. So I just added some things that I thought might be specific to Florida, whether you're outside hiking or going to the beach or swimming or just things like that. So. so the first thing I wanted to talk about was kind of the difference between front country and back country. So those are things that you might hear in wilderness medicine. So just to give you a little background on myself, I took a wilderness first responder course. That's a really intense, like 80 hour course about wilderness medicine. And um, so the difference between front country and back country. Front country is defined as a place that's accessible by vehicle. And then back country, if you can hit the slide, is somewhere that's about an hour or two from definitive care. So most of the places in Florida, most of your state parks and beaches and things like that are gonna be kind of front country. You're gonna be able to get there with a car. You're gonna have access to kind of phones or rangers or staff that's working there. We don't really have too much back country, but it's still important to know a little bit about wilderness medicine. Just even in a state park, you might have to wait a little, you know, until help arrives. So it's good to know what to do in the meantime. And then we're also going to talk about kind of urban versus wilderness medicine. So what do you think is the difference between if you get hurt in an urban environment versus getting hurt in kind of in the wilderness in a park or on a beach? Any thoughts? What do you think? You can't call 911. Right, sometimes you cannot call 911. <laughs> Anything else versus if you're injured in like a mall downtown versus a park? Anything? Right, there's less people to help you. You also have less resources. It's one of the big things with wilderness medicine is kind of learning to work with what you have around you. All right, so first thing we're gonna talk about is wildlife safety. So this is a pretty big section in the PowerPoint just because Florida's famous for a lot of the diverse wildlife it has, but that's also one of the things that people tend to be a little weary about when going out. So we're just gonna talk about some of the animals you might find and what to do if you see them. So the first, we have a few large mammals here. So we have the black bear, um, bobcats, and then we have Florida panthers, which are generally not this far north, but still have them. So does anyone know what to do if you run into a big mammal like this? What do you think you should? If you're hiking alone and you see one right in front of you, what are you gonna do? What do you, run? <laughs> That's a very good instinct, <laughs> right? You better run real fast. <laughs> exactly. So with these animals, they're all predators. So the last thing you want to do actually is run. So it might feel natural to see a panther and want to run away, but that's going to kick off its hunting instinct. So they're trained to hunt other things. If you start running, they're going to associate you with prey and they're going to chase you. It's the same thing if you see a dog or pretty much any type of big cat in the wild. So if you can hit that. So like we said, we're not gonna run and you don't wanna turn your back on an animal like this. If you see a bear or something, you always wanna know where it is. You don't wanna give it the chance to kind of sneak up on you. Um, you wanna talk just kind of like I'm talking right now so that they know that you're a human and that you're not something that they're hunting. Talk, kind of wave your arms around, make yourself seem bigger. You do not want to play dead. Playing dead is what you do for grizzly bears, apparently. We don't have grizzly bears in Florida. But you do not want to do that with a black bear. A black bear, your safest bet. Make yourself self seem bigger. Talk a lot. Um, keeping eye contact is really important, especially with cats. Because like I said, they do have that hunting instinct. So generally, when they see prey, their prey is not going to stand there and stare them down. So they're going to take that as kind of a threat and they're going to be intimidated and walk away from you. And just know any animal bite requires medical attention. So obviously if you get bit by a panther you would know you'd probably need to see a doctor. But even a raccoon bite or a possum or a squirrel because animals can carry rabies. You might need a tetanus shot. There's a lot of things that could go wrong with that. So does anyone think that this bear is aggressive right there, the one standing up? So black bears, when they're standing up like that, that actually doesn't mean that they're being aggressive. It means that they're curious. So they stand up like that when they want to know a little more. So if you see one that's kind of on his hind two legs, it's not really anything to be worried about. He's just trying to get a better look at the situation. 
it's not, it's more when they're on all fours that they're going to go into kind of attack mode. So next thing, we have tons of insects in Florida, right? What are some of the insects we have to watch out for here? I had a question though. Oh yeah, go ahead. Boars um, are very scared of humans, so it's the same with making noise. They're also an invasive species, so they are hunted pretty regularly, so they know to avoid humans because they're being hunted so frequently in Florida. So it's going to be the same thing. You want to make a lot of noise. Um, I've been out hiking, and you can kind of hear them squealing, and if you just start talking, they'll pretty much get out. They don't want any interaction with people. And yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to interrupt me. Yeah, what are some of the bugs we have to worry about in Florida? We have ticks, obviously, mosquitoes that carry diseases. Yeah, anything else? Black widows, chiggers, right? So some tips for that, obviously, wearing long sleeve shirts, long sleeve pants is always good if you're going to be hiking, um, using insect repellents. It's really important if you get bit by something to make sure you're not having an allergic reaction especially things like bees or ants. If your throat starts swelling up, if you start getting hives, that's a sign that you're going to need some serious medical attention. Another big one is to monitor your bug bites in general. You might get a tick bite and not think anything of it, but so this right here is called a bullseye. So that's from a tick bite, and that's a sign of an infection or Lyme disease or other diseases that can be caused by ticks. And then just check yourself for bugs or bites in general at the end of the day. And here we have a diagram on how to properly remove a tick. So you want to grab it as close to your skin as possible and pull it out. And you don't want to squish any of the abdomen because that can cause fluid to leak into the bite and can cause it to get infected. And you also don't want to leave the head in there for the same reason. So you just want to get close and pull it out and try to get the whole body and then kind of disinfect it, wash the bite with soap and water, maybe some alcohol. Is there a specific insect repellent you should use or look for ingredients in? Um, the, high, the higher DEET concentrates, okay. concentrated ones work better. Some people don't like using things with higher right. DEET because it's just so many chemicals, but honestly, that's the best way yeah. to go. Um, okay. I know some mosquitoes don't... Sulfur? sulfur? I've never heard of that before, but I know I've heard mosquitoes don't like citronella and things like that. So there are some natural remedies that you can use, but kind of for ticks and for the more serious ones, unfortunately, it's just the high DEET content. Okay. And like you guys said, spider bites. So another reason in monitoring your bites is important because you don't know what bit you. Sometimes you might have a little bug bite that you think is just from a mosquito, and it could be something more serious. So you have the spider and brown recluse spiders. Uh, the black widow and brown recluse are two of the mo most dangerous ones in Florida. So the black widow, if you see this, a black spider with red underneath, you know those are very dangerous and venomous. You might not feel the bite right away, but in a few hours, you'll start having nausea, stomach cramps, vomiting, aches, things like that. So another thing, if you have a bug bite and then you start feeling really sick, that's not a good sign. That's a sign that you should get some medical attention. And then brown recluse doesn't have really as strong a venom as a black widow, but they do cause a lot of infection in their bites. A lot of kind of your skin can get really grossed out. And so it's a good thing to monitor just seeing if the bite's getting worse or if it's looking nastier and things like that. So you can hit the next. So if you do know that you get bit by a spider, you want to clean it out with soap and water, disinfect it, put some ice on it and elevate it if possible, and seek medical attention. So deaths from black widows are very rare. They're, as long as you go to a hospital, you're most likely going to be okay. But it is very important to get medical attention right away if you know that one bit you. And speaking of bites, we have snakes, of course, in Florida. So does anyone know what these three snakes are? Anyone know what they are? So this here is a cotton mouth, a water moccasin. And we have a pygmy rattlesnake and an eastern diamondback rattlesnake. So these are the three pit vipers we have in central Florida. So they have a hemotoxin venom. So it's a certain type of snake bite. Um, 
These snake bites are going to be really painful, but they're usually not deadly, which is a good thing. The hemotoxin affects your tissues and your organs, so it's going to cause an inflammation of your organs. So if you don't ever seek medical attention for a rattlesnake bite, it will be fatal, but most of the time, you go to the hospital and you should be fine. If you get bit by a snake, by one of these snakes, the most important thing to do is remain calm. So once you get bit and it injects the venom, the faster your heart beats, the faster it's gonna spread that venom through your body. So you wanna stay calm, don't drink any caffeine or alcohol that could like affect your heart rate. You don't wanna be running around or doing anything that's gonna increase that. And then do not suck the venom. You need an anti-venom. Sucking the venom isn't gonna change that and it could cause an infection in the bite wound. Uh, do not use a tourniquet. That's something people thought if you used a tourniquet, then it would stop the venom from spreading elsewhere. But we do have anti-venom readily available, and using a tourniquet is most likely going to lead to an amputation of that limb. And then applying ice on a snake bite could cause frostbite on that area. So you don't want to do that. If anything, you can wash it out a little with soap and water, but the most important thing is staying calm and calling an ambulance or getting some medical help. So the next snake that we have, the last snake that we have, thankfully, are coral snakes. So they have a different type of venom than the rattlesnakes and the moccasins do. They have a neurotoxin venom. So what that does is it affects your nervous system. So that venom is a lot more dangerous than the hemotoxins that rattlesnakes have. But luckily, we've had no deaths from a coral snake bite since the 1960s when the antivenom was invented. So it's good. So what you're going to do for this snake bite, pretty much the same thing. You don't want to suck out the poison, don't want to put ice on it. But you're going to wrap the bite up with a pressure bandage. So this is the bite mark on his ankle. You're going to start distally, which means kind of at the end of the limb, and go towards your heart and wrap that up as tight as you can to stop that venom from spreading. And you're only going to do this with coral snake bites. No other animals, just coral snakes. So that's going to keep the venom localized here and stop it from spreading. And if possible, you're going to want to splint that limb so you can immobilize it as much as you can. And we're going to talk about making splints a little bit towards the end. So yeah, you can go. Yeah, so if you want to go, so first of all, coral snakes always have a black nose. So the other one's going to have a red nose. So that's one way to tell. And then there's the rhyme, um, red touches yellow, kill a fellow, and red touches black, friend of Jack. So just remember, red touches yellow, kill a fellow. Yeah, but the easiest thing is, like, the black nose is going to be the coral snake. Good. So the next, oh, sorry, go ahead. If you do get bit by one, I mean, how long? I mean, do you have to get to the hospital very fast, or? For a coral snake, you should get there pretty quickly, um, just because the venom is so dangerous. I've heard rattlesnake and water moccasins bites are very painful, so you're probably just going to want to get there fast to make the pain stop. And then in terms of anti-venom, it's pretty readily available in Florida. I know they have large kind of stores of it in Miami and in Atlanta, so we're in a good place. It's never going to be an issue about having to get more. But you do want to get there as quickly as possible. And even the rattlesnake bites, they're not as deadly, but they could cause permanent damage to the limb if you wait too long. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Is there a way to know, like, areas, like, you know, here in Florida, we don't go into the water because we go into alligators. But mm -hmm. is there a way to know, like, if you're hiking areas that they like to, like, <coughs> well, Marcus is probably like the water, but, like, is there any areas to know where they yeah. make their... So, Coral snakes and rattlesnakes generally like to live in burrows underground. They like to live in logs or under leaf litter. They like to hide from people. So if you ever see a hole in the ground, you don't wood ever. Piles. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wood yeah, wood piles. Um, they like to hide. So when you're hiking, just keep in mind if you see like a pile of dead leaves, that would be a place that they would like to hide. They also, if it's really cold and they're going to come out to try to get that sun. So on kind of colder days, if it gets too cold, they'll hibernate. But on cold days, they'll start coming out and sunbathing. So you might see them more in the open. 
The next topic we're going to talk about is lightning, and you'll finally find out what that picture is for. Yay! <laughs> So Florida has one of the highest rates of lightning in the world, and there's a lot of misconceptions about what to do when you see lightning. So we're going to play a little game on true or false. So we'll start with the first one. So true or false, laying down on the ground will keep you safe from lightning outdoors. What you, false? Does anyone else think? <laughs> so that is false. So if lightning strikes the ground, it can actually travel pretty far. So if you lay down, you're just maximizing that chance of getting your whole body hit by the current. So you don't want to do that. And then the next one, crouching down protects you from lightning. True or false? False. True? Okay. So it's actually false. Crouching is going to be, it minimizes your risk of getting struck, but it's not foolproof. Nothing. If you hear lightning, the best thing to do is get inside. There's no method when you're outside to 100% avoid it. But we'll talk about the crouching position in a little bit and why it helps. Uh, so the next one, lightning strike victims carry an electric current and should not be touched. True. True. That one is actually oh, false. True. Is it? Uh -huh. So that's a big misconception that someone struck by lightning could still have a current. They need immediate medical attention, and a lot of times they don't get it because people think they're still positive. So if someone gets struck by lightning, you should go over as soon as you can. They probably need CPR. You should call an ambulance, but you don't need to avoid touching them. And then true or false, rubber tires on a car keep you safe from lightning. <laughs> Yep, so that one is false. It's actually the metal in a car that keeps you safe. So when you're looking for shelter, you don't want to go in a golf car or like an ATV or a convertible. You want to be fully enclosed in metal. And as long as you're in your seat and not touching the metal, the lightning will strike the car and hit the metal, but you should be fine inside of it. And then the last one, lightning can travel between 50 to 100 feet. Yeah, so that one is true. So if lightning strikes, if it hits the ground, that current can travel up to 100 feet on the ground. So that's a note, like you were saying, with people thinking that someone has an electric shock. It's not so much that they still have that current, but that the lightning travels so far. So if you, there's a little picture here about the crouching method. So if you are outside and you absolutely cannot escape a lightning storm, this is the best position you want to be in. You want to be crouched down on your toes. That way you have as little of your body on the ground as possible. You want to cover your ears because lightning strikes are very loud. That's one of the worst things, apparently. And then you're going to be like leaned over like this, and that's going to protect your internal organs so that if you do get struck, it's just going to hit your back. It's so like I said, not a full proof, but just the safest way to avoid it or the safest position to be in if you do get struck. And if you're in a group of people, you want to be 100 feet away from everyone. Because like I said, that lightning can travel through the ground. It can bounce off one person to the next person. So you definitely want to split up and kind of minimize your chances. So now we can go over to this drawing, this wonderful drawing that I have here. So this is going to simulate your area outside. And we're going to talk about different places you can hide from lightning and how safe you would think they are. So let's say the top of the hill. Do you think that's a safe place to go? No. No, right, not at all. So we'll, we'll put a sad face here. <laughs> and what about under one lone tall tree? Do you think you should hide under a tree? Right, exactly. So this is also not a good place. <laughs> what if you're alone in a big valley by yourself? Should you hide there? No, why not? But there's no trees in the valley. You have nothing surrounding you. If you're out in the open, you've got no other place to go. Okay, so you say maybe if you have no choice. What about kind of a cluster of smaller trees? No. Oh, the trees catching around it. Yeah, this picture is not really drawn to scale. 
unfortunately. <laughs> so we're going to pretend like there's more area between that. <laughs> what about in a ditch? Should you hide in a ditch? Yeah. Yes? You want to yeah. be the lowest point. Exactly. And then obviously going inside is your best bet, hiding inside your house. Yeah. Right, so you can talk about this a little more now in the next slide. So you want to stay away from open fields or the top of the hill. So if you're in an open valley and you're the only thing there, lightning is going to strike the tallest thing in an area. So if it's just you in a giant field, you're going to be the first thing it strikes, unfortunately. It is, however, safer to stay closer to a lower strand of trees if that's your only option. It's not ideal, but if you have a group of trees, it's not the same as one lone tree that's kind of attracting attention. And if they're all taller than you, the attention's not on you. Of course, like one of the trees could get hit and catch on fire or fall, so you do have that. It's not ideal, but it's better than being in a valley or on a hilltop. Um, finding a low area, a valley or a ravine, a ditch, that's going to be your best bet if you're out in the open. You want to spread out, like I said, lightning can travel so far, and avoid water, metal objects, or concrete. So obviously water and metal are conductors of lightning, so you don't want to be near that. But lightning can actually kind of bounce off concrete and still hit you. So one of the things you'll see in parks or theme parks when it starts raining and thundering is everyone will go to a picnic pavilion and crowd under there and hide under the rain. And that's one of the most dangerous things you can do, because you're all in one group. If one person gets hit, everyone's getting hit. And then you're surrounded by concrete. So that lightning's not just going to hit you, it's going to hit the concrete and keep bouncing off. So that's a terrible place to hide. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> and then, of course, um, you've probably all heard this, but wait 30 minutes after the, you hear the last rumble of thunder before going outside or resuming water activities. Next thing is sea safety. So of course, Florida is famous for its beaches. There's also a whole set of things that come with that or some medical problems you could face with beaches. So one of them is marine injuries. Not really going to touch on sharks today. I think everyone has kind of had that. Yeah, shark week. There's a whole week for it. Yeah. <laughs> but we have stingrays and we have jellyfish and even we have invasive lionfish and corals and things like that that can hurt you and you want to know what to do when that happens. So if you get stung by a jellyfish or by a stingray, you want to use tweezers or a credit card to kind of shave off the tentacles. You don't want to touch it with your hand because that's just going to keep spreading it. Really the best thing is a credit card doing that shaving motion to get off all the tentacles. And then you want to wash it with ocean water. So if you still have tentacles on you and you put fresh water on it, that's going to make it a lot more painful. The venom reacts with fresh water and it's going to hurt a lot more. If you have a jellyfish sting, vinegar works really well for that as well, but only for jellyfish. And then once you do get all the tentacles and the venom out, then you should soak it in warm water. You can use fresh water. And do not apply urine or gasoline. Those are just myths. They don't actually... I'd never heard of gasoline, but don't do that. So now all these dead jellyfish, do you think they're safe to touch if they're dead? No, no so jellyfish can still sting you even if they're dead and washed up on shore. Now, the next thing that's not really an animal are rip currents, and that's a big issue we have on beaches as well. So this diagram kind of shows you what to do if you're trapped in a rip current. So your natural instinct is going to try to be to swim against it. And that's just going to keep pulling you back away from the shore. So what you need to do is swim parallel to the shoreline, parallel to the beach, and get out of that current, and then swim to shore once you're out of it. And rip currents are a current of water that's moving away from the shore. And they can sweep away even the strongest swimmer out to sea. So in the next picture, you'll kind of be able to see what it looks like in the ocean. So if you're at the beach and you see something, you're going to see like a distinct break or a little tunnel or a pathway. That's a sign of a rip current. I'm going to look for differences in the foam or in the bubbling, differences in the waves. That's another sign. And then you're going to see if there's any debris or like seaweed and stuff being pulled away from the shoreline. 
that's a sign of a strong current as well. So another big one we have in Florida are heat-related illnesses. So we have heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Does anyone know the difference between the two? No? Any thoughts? So the symptoms for heat exhaustion, you're going to have fatigue, nausea, headache, muscle cramps, dizziness, kind of the usual, and you're going to be sweating and have cold, clammy skin. With a heat stroke, you're going to have all these symptoms, and then it could get worse. You might have, you know, your increased body temperature, that's a big one, confusion, delirium, convulsions, but your biggest indicator of a heat stroke is you're no longer sweating. So if anyone has all these signs and they're not sweating at all, that's a very bad sign. Heat strokes can affect your brain, they can send you into shock, and they can potentially kill you. So it's very serious and requires immediate medical attention. You can go to the next one. So if someone has heat exhaustion, that means they're still sweating, they're still, you know, they're not having heat stroke, you're going to want to get them out of the heat into an air conditioning place take a cold shower, spray them with water, drink cool, non-alcoholic, and non-caffeinated beverages because those can dehydrate you further, and avoid physical activities. <coughs> For heat stroke, like I said, you're going to need to seek immediate medical attention. That usually requires IV fluids and additional care to lower that body temperature. In the meantime, do not use ice packs on older, uh, older patients or young children. So heat strokes most commonly occur in people's houses when their AC breaks, which sounds kind of silly, but especially think about it in Florida when it's 95 degrees and your AC breaks and you think you're just going to tough it out. And it does happen in older patients and young children a lot. So it's not something just when you're outside at 12 o'clock noon, it could happen anytime. So while you're waiting for medical care to arrive, you want to try and cool down the patient. If they're of the appropriate age, you can give them ice packs and things like that. Try to put water on them, get them in air condition. Another thing you want to do is focus on the neck and the armpit and like the groins, the areas with lymph nodes, because those places have a lot of blood vessels in them. So if you put an ice pack on your armpits or on your neck, that's going to cool all that blood in those blood vessels that's going to go around your body and help lower your body temperature. So another issue that might seem like heat stroke, that happens pretty commonly as well. People might have all these symptoms and tell you that they're drinking a lot of water. So does anyone know what that might mean? If they're showing all the symptoms of heat exhaustion, but drinking water like crazy, super hydrated, not very hot. So you can actually get sick from drinking too much water, which is something that People in Florida freak out, start drinking all this water, and that'll actually cause your sodium levels to go down too far, which will make you sick as well and could be very serious also. And they're going to have all those same symptoms. So a lot of times you'll tell them to drink more water to get inside or keep doing what they're doing, and then that's going to make it worse. So one of the things that you can do, which might sound a little gross, but asking what their urine color is, is going to be a good indication. If they have dark yellow urine, it's a sign that they're dehydrated. But if they're having clear urine and then all these symptoms, then they might be drinking too much water. You might need to get them to eat something salty. Go on. <coughs> okay, so now the hands-on part, so sprains, strains, and fractures, something that happens pretty commonly if you're out hiking. Let's go. So has everyone heard of rice? Do you know what that is? What does the R stand for? Rest, right? And then the I? Ice. And then C? Science. <laughs> this is a good guess. Compression. Compression, yep. And then the E, elevation. Yep, so that's the first thing you want to do if you sprain or you bruise a body part. And then you're also going to want to check um, CSMs. So you probably don't know what that stands for, but that's circulation, sensation, and motion. So if someone twists their ankle, you want to first see if you can feel a pulse down there. 
So I would recommend kind of knowing how to feel your own pulse on your wrist and on your ankle. Because if you hurt your ankle or you hurt your arm and you don't feel that pulse, that's a pretty good sign that you broke something or it's a serious fracture or it's dislocated. The other one is sensation. If someone rolls their ankle and they can't feel anything, it's numb or it's tingly, it's another bad sign. And then motion, obviously, if they break it and cannot use it at all, it's a sign that it's more serious. <coughs> yeah, sorry. So one of the best things you can learn how to do is making a sling and swath. So it's pretty good for any arm injuries, wrist injuries, elbow, even your clavicle, your shoulder. Just a way to immobilize the limb so you're able to walk out at least and get medical attention. So normally you can use, they sell triangular bandages that you can use for this. Um, they're like $5 online. But if we're going to pretend like we're out in the wilderness and we don't have any resources, you're going to use what's available to you. So can I get a volunteer? Do one of you want to come up and get a sling? No? Okay. <laughs> it's okay. So what you're going to do is you're going to take a triangular bandage, fold it in a triangle, and then tie a knot at one of the ends of the triangle. So I'm going to do this on myself. Obviously, if I broke a limb, I would not be doing this that easily. But once you tie the knot, you're going to tie it around the person's neck. So your first step. And then their, hand, their elbow is going to go in this knot, pretty much. And you want it to be tight enough that they can't really move it around too much, but not too tight that it's cutting off blood circulation. And you want to be able to access their fingers, and that's because of the CSMs. You want to keep checking if there's circulation, sensation, and motion. Even after the injury happened, you want to check that about every five minutes to make sure that nothing's changed. So once you get that, here, I'll tie this a little better. And you want to tie it at an angle that's not uncomfortable for them. You don't want to tie their hand up too high or too low or anything. So there, you got your first one, you got a nice little sling, have your hand sticking out. And then for the swath, pretty much. It's a, I think I, I practiced this. There you go. So the swath is just going to come around their side like that. And this, I just did this on my own, but it's pretty, you can still kind of bend over and it's not coming out. It feels pretty stable. It's not too tight. You can still get to my hand and that's going to keep your arm mobilized. It's going to cause less pain if you're hiking out. Um, so that's the official way to do it with your triangular bandages. bandages. So if you go to the next slide, I think we have some improvised slings and sloths. So like I said, one of the biggest things in wilderness medicine is not having proper supplies with you. You're out hiking, you're not prepared. So here we have some examples, you know, just having a jacket, you can just kind of bring that up and kind of pin it up to hold your arm. If you're wearing a button-up shirt, just opening one of the buttons and putting your arm in there, um, putting your arm in a backpack strap, pinning it to the backpack, just using rope or anything that you can find to kind of hold that arm up. One of the things I like to use a lot are hoodies. They're actually very pretty effective and multi-use. multi, multi -use. So just the sleeves kind of work to tie it around like this. And then you can put your arm like in the hood of the jacket or just in the long sleeve shirt. So that works pretty well. And even just using another long sleeve shirt to tie the swath around. So the big thing about wilderness medicine is just getting creative with what you have and knowing how to use your resources. The so next one is splinting. Sling and swath is kind of more, uh, you kind of want to do them both in conjunction, but splinting is further to immobilize that limb. So remember with the coral snake bites, they talked about bandaging them up so we keep the venom localized and then splinting it to immobilize the limb. So what you want to do with splinting is um, you want to make sure you have something rigid that's going to hold the limb down. So these things are called SAM splints. They're very versatile and very awesome to use. I would suggest if you go out hiking a lot, it's about $10 or $20 online. And you can kind of fold them out and mold them into the shape of your arm or your leg. And they work really well as a splint. And they're pretty small to wrap up and carry with you. But you're going to have the SAM splint out 
or a stick or anything hard that you can use to keep that arm straight or the leg straight. So you want it to be rigid. You want it to be padded. Um, someone obviously just may have broken a bone or dislocated something. So you want it to be comfortable for them. So adding gauze or bandages or even scarves or bandanas, anything you might have to make it more padded. You want to make it adjustable just in case anything does happen if they need to reach their arm or move around more. You want to be able to move it if you need to. And of course, have your fingers and toes accessible for CSMs. And then you want to immobilize joints and bones above and below the injury. So if I hurt my forearm, you're going to want to immobilize the elbow and the wrist to keep everything still. And then splint in a position of comfort, just like the sling and swath. You don't want to have their arm too high or too low. Make sure that they're comfortable. And then just like with the sling and swath, there's tons of ways you can improvise a splint if you don't have a fancy SAM splint. You can use, again, a long sleeve shirt. Um, got some crutches in there, a scarf for padding. Um, another popular one is using pillows and sleeping bags out in the wilderness. Um, for padding and just putting sticks in there to keep it rigid. And just duct tape, rope, anything you can find works really well. So after, one of the biggest things with this is taking a first aid kit with you to avoid injuries. But a lot of these first aid kits are pretty generic. You know, they all have things like Band-Aids or anti, you know, Neosporin, things like that but not too helpful if you run into a panther or get like stung by a stingray or break something. So we really recommend kind of customizing your own first aid kit. It's cheaper to make one yourself. You can add things that are specific to you. Like I'm severely allergic to shellfish, so I would probably always carry Benadryl or an EpiPen, things like that. You know, if you're always in the ocean and there's jellyfish everywhere, maybe adding vinegar to it, things just making it your own. Does so anyone have any thoughts on what they would put in their first aid kit? Kind of specific to you? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know? <laughs> That's a good thing to start thinking about. Maybe you want to put band like some of the triangular bandages in there in case you need to make a sling and swath or a pressure bandage if you're worried about seeing a coral snake, just things like that. So, so if you want more information on kind of wilderness medical stuff, um, Knowles, the National Outdoor Leadership School, offers a lot of courses in that. Um, there's courses like the ones I took, or Wilderness EMT courses, that's even higher than that, or just Wilderness First Aid, which is a shorter course and more basic, if this is something you're interested in. Also, their YouTube channel has a lot of really great videos. Um, if you just search in YouTube, Knowles Wilderness Medicine, it'll show you how to make a splint, how to cure a clavicle fracture, how to check a spinal injury. They have so many things, like these videos are really helpful if you want to know more. And then Landmark Learning is, is another one like Knowles that has um, kind of courses like this. They're more based in the south. Knowles is more kind of in the west in the mountains. And Landmark Learning, the same thing, also has videos on YouTube and online that can help you out. 